and they're they're all very similar. So what what should our <coughs> our answer be? I'm getting uh oh, okay. Sure, we'll uh one, two, three, zero, zero, zero times Maybe I'll uh, I'll put this over here, and I'll put oops this over here. So you're saying that space is uh, no, no, it's not a decimal. It's uh, it's just they're breaking it up. You can imagine a comma there. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So basically, you you got one hundred twenty-three thousand times. 3,234. But instead of a comma, they're using a space. Okay, Because comma is a, uh, an American thing. Um, if you go internationally, they don't, they generally use a dot. Uh, so it's, it's different. Different wherever you go. Okay. So anyway, um, you get C, right? Yay, okay. 100% so far. Is, is everybody good with C? 3.98 times 10 to the 8, okay? Because you get something like 3978 something. 39778 seven, or something, yeah. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. okay. So we want 3.98, okay. So this is a subtraction problem. 7.987 minus 0. 5.4 So then what do we do? So we have uh, two figures after the decimal. It's an addition subtraction problem. So it's not, we're not looking for only so we're gonna we're not doing two des uh, two significant figures. So it's not gonna be B or C, but two spots after the decimal because it's addition subtraction. Do we remember right? Yeah. Okay. So it's gonna be A. A is the answer. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got it. We got it. We got it. Okay. More practice here. All right. Okay. So some of these you don't even have to do the math because all the numbers and the answers are are the same. It would be C, right? Because we're doing a subtraction problem. We've got three spots after the decimal. We want to preserve that precision, so we're going to choose C. We good? All right. Mass of a watch glass was measured four times, and so we have we have four different numbers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're going to add all of these together, and then we're going to divide by four, right, to get the average. So uh, if I add all of these, so added all together, I get uh, 400.021. And if I divide by 4, So this is just what the calculator spits out. The calculator spits out 100.00525, OK? So knowing that, that the calculator spits that out, what should our answer choice be? OK. 
<laughs> okay. So, so um, when you add up the four numbers, okay, you get 400.021, and you preserve all of these decimals, right? Because we have three spots after the decimal for each of these things. So we're going to have three spots after the decimal. Is, is, that, is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. And then we divide by four. Um, four doesn't count because it's an exact number. I mean, we don't have to worry about the significant figures in four. So if we have six significant figures here, so our final answer should have six significant figures. So we're going to choose B. Is, is that okay? Yes, sir. All right. So even though um, this one only has five, it, we don't have to worry about that because it's cared for in the addition portion. And then we, we do the division. Okay. So um, it's talking about this. Um, this. It's not plus one. It's 1,200. This is what it should look like, okay? So we've got, got this. How many, um, which of the following statements are true? You don't have to do the math. We would have three decimal places, three significant figures, one decimal place. One decimal place, right? Because we're doing addition, so we're not worrying about the figures, the decimal places, and we go with the least precise one. Okay, are you guys able to see this? So imagine this being uh, a burette and you're getting the reading here. So how would, what reading would you give it? Zero, zero, five, what, 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 what? Eight. Point zero, right? Because we're going, um, we have, we know up to basically one, the the ones place, and then the one after that we have to guess, okay? And we shouldn't guess any more than that, so we just guess uh, one space. Okay, so I'll just to help you guys out, one point two three times 0.89 on the calculator spits out 1.0947. So the calculator spits out 1.0947. Is that what we choose or what do we... Uh... Hmm. <laughs> okay, so you know people are trying to d debate between C and D. So we're doing multiplication, so we have to look at how many significant figures we've got. Here we have three here, but two over here, right? There's only two in this one, so our final answer should only have two significant figures. So our answer choice is C. Okay. Sarah, did you want to make an announcement? Oh, no, no, no. just interrupt, no problem. Yes, we'll take a... All right, we shall uh, resume then. <laughs> I'm sure you guys love this stuff. Um, all right, oh, this is uh, how many significant figures do we have in this measurement? 1.3000 meters. Two, five, three, four? Five, right? Because the zeros that trail after the decimal place are significant, so we're going to say five. You got it, you got it. <laughs> okay, uh, what about this one? Significant figures in this one. We're in agreement at six. The zeros after... Yeah, that's a decimal point. Uh, how do I make this bigger? Uh, yeah, no, no, that's not that much better. Okay, six. Okay, round the following to three significant figures. So what do we do? 
A, B, C, or D? C, right? We got it. This is it. After the third, the fourth one is an 8, so it goes up, which says we have to go 9, 1, 0, and we want to preserve that 0 to, to indicate that we have that much precision, because this suddenly drops us down to two significant figures. How many significant figures are in this measurement? Three, right? Because the leading zeros are not significant. Um, so we got all these zeros over here. They are not significant. But this one is. So we have three. So if you had to report a number for this measured red line, what would we say? Five point seven, right? We just want to, because the last number we're just guessing, right? We know it's more than five. We know it's less than six. The last number we're guessing, and so we're either gonna have to guess five point five or five point seven, and it looks like it's more than five point five. So we're gonna say five point seven. Okay, we shouldn't try to guess more than that, more than one one place. Now this is kind of hard to read. But uh, so two point. So this thing is at two point eight. Now do we uh, eight zero or two point eight? Yeah. So we have up to the these tick marks. So we have the tick marks. So we know it's at least two point eight, and then we guess the last decimal. So we're gonna say two point eight zero. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. The last one? I know it's a little blurry, this picture. but OK, 923. Because um, so when you, when you do measurements, e even though, so you can, all right, so we're, we agree that it should be 2.8 something, right? Or 2.8, and we, we want to know why are we putting in a 0? So. <clears throat> What you do is you, you report the numbers you know, and then you do one more digit beyond the tick marks that you have. Okay, So we have tick marks that tell us that it's going to be at least 2.8. And then we, we guess the last decimal. Um, and in this case, we would guess a 0. So that's normal standard operating procedure? Yes, yes. I mean. You might have some places, I think at the very beginning I said some places might disagree and, and, uh, and you just report to what you have tick marks for. But if you're, if, if you're in a situation where you're kind of measuring with your eyes, it's standard to go up to what you have and then one more decimal. Okay. Now if you have um, like a digital scale, you're not going to guess. You're just going to report what the digital scale tells you, okay? Or you have some kind of micrometer with a with a certain amount of precision dialed into the micrometer. You just go with that, okay? But a lot of times with rulers or using, you know, measuring um, volumes with burettes and things like that, you're going to go up to the markings that are there, and then you guess the last decimal. Yeah. Correct. Ah. That that's what it this that's what this signifies. It, you're, when you have two point eight, it's essentially saying you were between two point two and three, mm. and you were guessing that eight, which you, which was what we had in the previous situation, right? So in this case, they have the half tick marks, but that's not really a precise level. So you, you see you're between the 5 and the 6, and you're basically guessing that last digit to be 7. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, so in this case, what you, you are basically indicating that you actually do have the precision to go to 2.8, and that last digit is, is guessed. 
Now, digital scales, things like that, you're just going to report what the, what the machine tells you. You're not going <laughs> to try to guess another number beyond what the machine tells you. So, um, and, and that's because the machine itself, um, well, depending on the, the manufacturer and things like that, a lot of times it's guessing that very last decimal. So sometimes if you buy a bathroom scale, a digital bathroom scale, and you step on it, it'll say, you know, you weigh this much, and, um, and then sometimes you take a step off and you step on it again, that last decimal might fluctuate a little bit. And that's not to say it's an inaccurate scale. It's just, it's doing, it's doing the best it can. So it is an inaccurate Huh? So it is an inaccurate Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the, the final, final decimal. And, and, and some, uh, I guess it depends from scale manufacturer to scale manufacturer, how they, they handle that thing. But, um, but that's, that's, that's how we go. Yes. All right. OK. So 923 divided by 2312. OK, so they're all going to be some variation of this, 0 0.04 something. How many decimals do we want to keep? Or how many significant figures do we want? So we want to keep three, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be, uh, let's see, but I'll just verify. <clears throat> yeah. So we're going to, we, we have three significant digits here, and we got five over here, but we're going to go down to three, and this one still has, this one has three, right? This one only has two, this one only has one, and this one has three, but you've thrown away some, like, you did rounding incorrectly here. OK, this one. Here, I'll, I'll punch these into the calculator. So 3.12 plus 0.8 plus 1.033 adds up to 4.953. We get 4.953 when you punch these into the calculator. So what should we choose? So we want, we want to keep uh, one spot after the decimal in our addition. Okay, we want to keep one spot after the decimal. So um, uh, it's either going to be A or D, okay? And because the digit after the 9 is a 5, it goes up. So it becomes 5.0, and we get A. Is that, is that OK? Yeah. Convert the following measurement to scientific notation. 101,000 grams. So again, uh, this, this site treats these digits as non-significant. Uh, again, it's. Truly, it's actually ambiguous, um, but there's no decimal at the end, so we're going to treat these zeros as ambiguous. So we will go with 1.01 times 10 to the 5. <clears throat> okay. A piece of stone has a mass of 24.595 grams and a volume of 5.34 centimeters cubed, OK? So it says, what's the density? And we're going to do mass over volume. So do we want to do, what do we want to do? Do we want to do 24.595 divided by the volume, or 5.34 divided by 24.595? Yeah, mass over volume. So we're going to do 24.595 over 5.34. And it's grams over centimeters cubed. Um, where we get 24.595 over 5.34. So you punch this into the calculator, and you get 4.605 
0.805, okay, so grams per centimeters cubed. How many significant figures should we keep? We want to keep three, right? We're doing a multiplication division, so we're, it's not about the decimal places, it's about the significant figures, and we want to keep three, so we're going to choose C. Okay, let's, uh, okay, um, it's asking how, um, how precise should we go? Thousandths, tenths, meters, hundredths of a centimeter. Yeah, first decimal place that is uncertain is tenths of a centimeter. Okay, so we, we would probably report 4.0 centimeters. Okay, so addition, so we only want to keep two decimals of precision. The only one that fits that would be D. And lastly, oh. so what would we say here? Eight point oh centimeters, eight point oh millimeters, seven point nine nine meters, seven point nine eight millimeters. Eight point zero millimeters, right? We want just one one extra decimal there. So we're gonna say that. All right. This is a little motor that's kind of crazy, huh? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so that wraps up significant figures. Now, um, I got to see a preview of the Hyergenics test, and I don't think there were actually any questions dealing with significant figures on the, on the test, okay? But um, it is important that you know you can handle significant figures and stuff um, in, in a lab setting and things like that. And so, and again, the, the driving force being you don't want to report more precision than what you have. Like uh, in the video, he's saying it's, you would be lying to, uh, to say that you are, um, you know all of these uh, digits to uh, that level of accuracy. <clears throat> okay, well, um, maybe uh, we'll do a quick review of what we covered last time. And so um, we talked about the mean, so we'll, we'll just do a review of mean, median, and mode. Okay, so first question. Why? Why do we bother calculating the mean, median, or mode of any of these, you know, any set of data that we might have? Why bother? Yes? I think the main is to find the balance of Okay, um, yeah, so the, the mean gives us the balancing point, that, that is true, okay, but why would we want the balance point? Okay, to get estimates, um, I, I, yes, the, the, the answer that I was looking for is um, we can summarize. We are summarizing all of our data with a single number, okay? The, the whole point of these different measures of center is to summarize uh, a bunch of other numbers, a bunch of data or other numbers, you know, uh, a set of numbers. Okay. 
I mean, you could pick any number, technically, any, if, without rhyme or reason, you could try to summarize a set of numbers. But I would say the mean, median, or mode, these um, are more likely to give you a representative summary. Okay, because when you, <clears throat> it's like somebody asks you to summarize uh, an entire movie with maybe one sentence, um, that's a difficult task to do, but you basically want to capture the essence of the movie in that one sen sentence. Um, so, you know, somebody says, well, you know, what's Titanic about? You would say, it's a love story on a boat that sinks, <laughs> or something. I don't know. You know, you could, you could and, and people might have different opinions on how it should be summarized and things like that. Um, but essentially, you want to capture the essence of the movie into one thing. And that's essentially what we are doing with any of these um, concepts of average. We are trying to summarize the values that we see in a data set with a single number. And we have the mean, median, and mode. So they, they emphasize different different aspects. The mean gives us the balancing point. The median gives us the halfway point. And the mode gives us the peaks or uh, most common values. OK, summarize a bunch of data. And this is especially useful. Uh, when making comparisons between sets of data. Um, don't shout out your answer, but just think. If you want your summary, um, and, uh, so the question is, should we use the mean in this situation, or should we use the median in this situation? Um, if we want our summary to not be affected by the outliers, we don't want our summary affected by outliers. So that was... Um, yeah, we would want we would want the median. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So that that was the example. Um, I think I did. Uh, we have the diner full of um, the diner's customers, and they have make this much money. And Bill Gates walks in. Okay, the average income in the diner is affected if we're looking at the mean. If Bill Gates walks in the average income in the diner suddenly shoots up a million bucks. Um, and maybe that's not, uh, that's not what we want. Okay? We don't want to say the typical income in this mining town is a million dollars, because um, that's probably not. Uh, well, accurate. It, it is accurate, because it is, it's just the mean, but it's not, maybe not. Um, a representative statement of the town, okay? But on the other hand, there are situations where you do want your answer affected by the outliers, and that was the uh, the insurance example. Yes, DDO. So the median was the halfway point between two versus central points or towards the outliers on the delta? Uh, okay, so the median, median is the halfway point. Um, well, so when you say central point, you're, you're thinking of the median. And it's basically uh, the value where half of the data is larger and half of the data is smaller. So half of the data is larger and half of the data is smaller. Okay. 
So whatever um, whatever the median is, if you've got 200 data points, the median is a spot where 100 data points are have values bigger than the median. 100 uh, data points have values smaller than the median. Um, <clears throat> wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so the truth is, we should never throw away numbers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so you might have very large data points. In general, you you never want to throw away data points. Okay. If they're very big or very small in comparison to everything else, what you should do first is you should investigate. Why do I have this freakishly large number? Okay, now it, as you investigate, it could turn out, oh, the person inputting the data accidentally um, hit the wrong button and input, you know, three extra zeros, and that's why it's so huge. Or, uh, or they did something, you know, like it was a typo, and that's why it's so so odd. In that case, yes, you can throw it away. But maybe it's Bill Gates, and you don't want to just throw away Bill Gates, but you might want to say, okay, in this situation, um, we should not include Bill Gates in our analysis because Bill Gates is very unusual, okay? And you, you should have a justified reason for it. But, um, you know, if you're in a manufacturing uh, process, and for some reason, uh, you know, you're doing inspections on these things and you get one piece that is very unusual, you shouldn't just say, oh, well, that's weird. Let's throw it away. You should say, wait a second. How did this part end up so weird? Maybe there's something, maybe something weird is happening with the machine that's making it. Okay. And we should, you should do, do some investigation or say, or say something. So the rule of thumb don't throw away data just because it feels weird or it's inconvenient to include in your analysis. Um, <clears throat> always investigate. If there's a justifiable reason to, to throw it away, sure, then throw it away. Or a justifiable re reason to exclude it in your analysis, that's fine. But if there's no good reason, you shouldn't just throw it away because it, it's an inconvenient. Um, that can get you into trouble later, right? Um, okay, so anyway, the point of these numbers is, uh, you know, we're summarizing a bunch of data. It's very useful when making comparisons. Um, the mean is affected by outliers, and sometimes that's good. The median is not affected by outliers. <clears throat> okay. Um, maybe I will uh, we'll go into right now, how can we tell if a number is an outlier or not? Okay. And there's all sorts of, there's many different methods as to determining what is an outlier. And so I'm going to just teach you one of the very basic methods for determining what is an outlier. I think that's what I was yes. I mean yeah. And uh, um, so uh, just that disclaimer there. OK. So how can we tell? if a point is an outlier. What's that? Um, so how can we tell if a point is an outlier? So there are um, many tests. Tests exist uh, for this. Uh, we will learn just one basic test.
So um, I'm trying to. I don't know. Yeah, there's many ways to make pancakes. Okay. One basic method is you buy uh, Bisquick and you follow the directions, and you'll get pancakes. Okay. And it's not necessarily the best pancakes you'll have, um, but it's it gets the job done. If somebody says make pancakes, that's an acceptable method. Okay. And so this basic method I'm teaching you, it's kind of like the Bisquick of the different methods. Okay, there's more complicated, more involved methods, like making pancakes from scratch. There's more ways to do this. This is a basic method. It gets the job done. Okay. Um, and so the uh, the idea is you um, you have a set of data. Okay. So let's say you've got. Um, you're measuring, um, you look at a bunch of cars and, uh, and how much horsepower there is. Okay, so you go to a used car lot and you say, I don't know, how, many, how much horsepower do, do these cars have? Okay, and so you got little cars with like 89 horsepower, you know, 92 horsepower, uh, 110. So I'm going to put these in order uh, from least to greatest. Let's say the last one has okay so we have eight eight numbers here and we want to know okay uh, and we look at these and we'd say you know this one looks like an outlier or it looks unusually large compared to the other other cars on the on the lot in terms of how much horsepower we have Okay, so um, we're going to um, to set up imaginary boundaries. Okay, so we set up two imaginary boundaries. That will um, decide if something is an outlier or not. And so uh, you can have an outlier because it's too big. You can have an outlier because it's too small. So you're going to have an upper boundary and a lower boundary. And uh, we're going to call these fences. You have an upper fence and a lower fence. OK? So these are the two boundaries. If a data point is bigger than the upper fence, I'm going to call this just UF, um, then it's an outlier. And if a data point is smaller than the lower fence, it's also an outlier. Yeah, so um, we're we're gonna do, yeah we're gonna we're gonna decide that. Okay, so if it's between the fences, then it will just be considered normal or regular non-outlier data. Okay, typical data. So if if it's bigger than the lower fence and smaller than the upper fence, it's just considered regular old data. Outside of the fences it'll be considered an outlier. Okay, so how do we determine, so where did these fences go? Okay, the upper fence, I'm gonna write two formulas, I guess, for lack of a better word. Upper fence is going to be defined as Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. 
Just write that down. We'll get into all of this. Don't worry. And the lower fence is going to be Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR. And IQR, because we don't even know what that is, is going to be equal to Q3 minus Q1. Simple way. Yeah, this is the simple way. <laughs> okay, so it's just right now it feels like a bunch of gibberish, and rightly so. <laughs> um, but I, I think it'll it'll make sense. I hope. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what Q three and Q one what these things are. Okay. So earlier, we, we talked about the median. And we said the median is a spot where half of your data points are larger and half of your data points are smaller. So in our data set, we look at eight cars on the used car lot. The median is the value where four of the data points are bigger, four of the data points are smaller. So where would, we, where would our median be? Yeah, so we would put... So because our data points are in order, it makes it easy. So our median goes right here. We have four points bigger, four points smaller. <clears throat> Q1 and Q3, these are known as quartiles. Okay. Um, Q1 is a spot where one quarter is smaller. Q3 is the spot where three quarters are smaller. <clears throat> so if I asked you to cut a sub sandwich into quarters, you would first cut it in half, and then you would cut each of those halves in half again, and you would have quarters. And that's essentially what we're going to do here. So um, I used the median to split my data points into two halves. If I wanted to split this lower half, these four data points, into half again, where would I draw a line? Between 92 and 110, right? So this spot is Q1, OK? This is the first quartile. So Q1 is the first quartile. And it is the spot where one quarter of the data is smaller. Okay, And to get it, you first find the median. OK. Then, quote, find the quote-unquote median of the lower half. Okay, so the idea being we first take our entire list, we find the median, and it splits it into half. And now that we have four numbers less than the median, we find the, basically the median of these four numbers, or we're splitting this in half again at Q1. So what do you think we would do for Q3? Same thing, but the larger half, OK? So Q3 is known as the third quartile. You basically do the exact same thing, but just on the upper half. So we go right here. Hmm? OK. So what is the value of Q1? So I would have to take the average of 92 and 110. So I would do 110 plus 92 divided by 2. And then divide that by 2. OK. 
and I would get 101. So my Q1 is equal to 101. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, so can anyone tell me what Q3 is equal to? One sixty five, yes. Okay, so yeah, basically you just did one forty plus one ninety divided by two. Okay, so that's Q three. What was the verbal definition of Q three? Q three, uh, three yeah, spot where three quarters of the data is smaller. Three quarters is smaller. Yeah. So third quartile, three quarters. You wouldn't say where one quarter is higher? You can say that also. Um, but in the context of calling it the third quartile, okay. it makes, I don't, it, it feels more appropriate to say three quarters smaller. Okay, first quartile is where one quarter is smaller. So it's, the, where the first quarter of the data is smaller, third quartiles where the the first three quarters are, are smaller, the third quarter, three quarters. Okay. What do you think the second quartile would be then? The second quartile is exactly the median. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mmm. So. <laughs> But we, we just call it the median, so no one calls it Q2. OK, so let's take this, and, uh, and we'll, we'll let me, um, uh, we'll take, uh, I don't know, how, how should I do this? Control-new, Control-V, OK. So gonna, let me take this. All right, and then so let me just clear this out. Here. And then let me uh, move this up. So using these things, we're going to decide what the fences are. Okay, so what would our IQR be? So first we would have to find the IQR. So IQR would be what? 165, Q3 is 165, minus Q1, which is 101. So I get an IQR of 64. Is that okay? So the IQR is 64. And now we're going to use this to define our upper fence and our lower fence. So the upper fence is Q3. What's Q3? 165 plus 1 and a half times the IQR, which is 64. Okay. So one and a half times 64 is 96. Yep. So we do 165 plus 96 following order of operations, and we get 261. So any data point that we have that's bigger than 261 is considered an outlier. But you still don't throw it out. You don't throw it out. You just have to say this is an outlier. Okay, any data point larger than 261 would be counted 
as an outlier. Okay, let's go the other direction for the lower fence. Lower fence would be Q1, 101 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 64. So I get 101 minus 96. The lower fence would be 5. Where's 96 again? 96 is 1.5 times the IQR. So 1.5 times 64. So any data point smaller than 5 would be counted as an outlier. OK. So, so according to this data, which may not be a representative data set, but if we go to this lot, and this is the, uh, the cars that we see. If we were to see a car that has less than five horsepower, that would be considered unusual, unusually low. Uh, and then on, uh, but over here on the upper end, if we have a car that's uh, with more than 261 horsepower in comparison to the other cars in the lot, it would be considered to be uh, unusually high. Now, if we looked at all the cars ever on the road, maybe we would have different classifications of what an outlier is. Um, but this is, this is, again, is just one simple method for determining what is an outlier and what's not. There's, again, more complicated methods, more than one way to make a pancake. But this is, this is one, one way that gets the job done. Okay. So it's not, it's not so awful, right? It's, you got to find the median, then the quart quartiles, and then from that you decide what is uh, large or not. Okay, let me, uh, let's, uh, I'm going to give you an, uh, an exercise here, okay, for you to try out. Let me, um, I'm going to use my stats computer program here. Don't worry, don't worry about what I'm typing in here. Uh, RT, uh, we'll say 16, no, no, 12, um. mm -hmm. Wait a second. Yes. Was there a name for that um, method of calculating outliers? I'm sorry? Was there a particular name for that method of calculating outliers? Was there a name for calculating? Uh, um, I don't. I don't know if there's a name for it. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know if there's a. I know there's names for everything, but I don't. I don't know the name for that off the top of my head. I'm, I apologize. Uh, yeah. Um. Well, so that it, it flags it as an outlier, and you just say, okay, well, this is uh, this is something a little, uh, I guess, unusual. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, that's uh, that's what we have. Okay, so here is another set of data points. Uh, see if you can decide which data points are outliers. Um, let's see. 38, 76, 78, 89. This is using the Yeah, using our, using our method. So determine what are outliers. So I'll say determine, uh, you know, Q1, Q3, the IQR, uh, the fences, and which points are outliers.
Alright, and I have 38. So these are already in order from least to greatest. So I think there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 data points.
Are we getting uh, Q1 and Q3 to be 89 and 119? Yep. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about this, but step one will be, uh, this is Q1 is 89, and Q3 is 119. So maybe I'll just list that over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, I guess I'll get into the, de the details uh, in a moment. And again, the uh, upper fence is defined by Q3 plus one and a half times the IQR. And the lower fence defined by Q1 minus one and a half times the IQR. <clears throat> Maybe I'll also write just so we remember. So I counted 14 data points, let's see. Okay. How are we doing? Good. Okay. So let's. Uh, so our first thing is to find the median, and then based on that, we can find Q1 and Q3. So we have 14 data points. So the median is the spot where 7 are larger and 7 are smaller, right? So we're going to find, we're going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and I'm going to draw a line here, and we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 larger. So we've got 7 larger, 7 smaller. This is going to be my median. My median goes between here and here, so I, I could do the math and I get a median of 105. That in of itself is not critical, but um, but we get the medians right here. And everyone's good with that? Yes. Okay. So now to get our quartiles, okay, now that we basically, you can imagine this being a sub sandwich with all of these numbers in a row, we cut it in half so we want to cut it in half again to get quarters. Okay, so I have seven numbers. So the spot where I'm going to cut it, so I get um, half of that being bigger and half smaller, I would have three and a half bigger, three and a half smaller. So I want to draw a line right here so that basically I'm going to choose 89 
and I will have three numbers bigger, three numbers smaller. Is that good? So my Q1 is 89. Also good with everyone? I do the same thing over here, and I end up picking 119. It's going to be Q3. So I have three numbers bigger, three numbers smaller. So, um, not, not, not in this case, okay? Because you have, when you draw the median, you have seven numbers smaller. So you want to get the middle of those seven numbers, okay? Now, if you go between 78 and 89, and if you drew the line here, then technically you only have three numbers on this side, and you would have four numbers bigger, okay? So that's no longer halfway in between. It's it's close, but it's a little off. Okay? So you want you want this and you want to pick this actual number as the um, Q1 so you have the same number larger as you do smaller. Can you do that to both sides? Okay. So we have Q3 is 119, Q1 is 89. So then our IQR is Q3 minus Q1 so I'm going to have 119 minus 89. My IQR is 30. Okay. I'm going to plug that in to our equations or formulas for the upper fence and lower fence. So my upper fence is Q3. What's Q3? 119 plus one and a half times the IQR. The IQR is 30. So I get 119 plus 45, 164. So anything larger than 64, 164, it will be an outlier. Uh, the lower fence, same idea. Q1 is 89. Common mistake is to uh, use 119 twice or you know use something other than Q1 there. So Q1 is 189 minus 1 1.5 times the IQR. Oops, IQR being 30. So I get 89 minus 45 and I get uh, 44, lower fence of 44. So anything less than 44 is an outlier. So if I look at my data points, uh, I'm gonna draw a green box around this. This is less than 44, so this is an outlier. Uh, this is bigger than 164, so this is an outlier. Okay. If this was 165 instead of 125, this would also be an outlier. Okay. But it's 125, so it's not. Is that okay? All right. Maybe we'll take a small break.